If the palace thought that 2023 would be a quieter year after the drama and tragedy of 2022, then the release of Prince Harry's autobiography Spare has just about destroyed all hope. A lot of you tonight have told me you have my back. Well, I'm also here to tell you I've always got yours. The book has caused international frenzy amongst the media and the public. Opinion is now more divided than ever on whether Prince Harry should retain his royal titles. Categorically, no negative story was ever planted with me. And I was the royal editor of the Mail on Sunday and The Sun, two of the biggest tabloids in Britain. Though Harry and Meghan fled the royal family for a second chance at the private life they've always wanted, the world refused to let them go quietly. Despite their escape, the media's continued attention caused a barrage of headlines, flaring up rumor after scandalous rumor about the couple and the royal family. In order to set the record straight, they decided to tell their own side of the story giving a tell-all series of interviews, podcasts, and Netflix documentary series. Have you had a chance to read your brother's book at all? But eclipsing all of the revelations shared previously, in January 2023, Harry released his controversial and much-anticipated autobiography, Spare. Harry's been the one to sort of pull the lever and say, enough. Despite their escape, the media's continued attention caused a barrage of headlines, flaring up rumor after scandalous rumor about the couple and the royal family. They feel very wronged, but they can't ask for privacy when they've made the Netflix series. It's opening up a can of worms. You'll watch that series and think, the royal family need looking after, they've come out of it better, or you'll be on the side of Harry and Meghan and think, wow, they had to put up with a lot and I'm on their side. She's becoming a royal rock star. And then... Everything changed. There's a hierarchy of the family. You know, there's leaking, but there's also planting of stories. There was a war against Meghan to suit other people's agendas. It's about hatred. It's about race. It's a dirty game. I think there's a sort of sense of both disappointment and exasperation at the palace uh, that the couple feel the need to keep going on about how miserable they were in their royal existence. At the same time, uh, you know, the couple feel that they, they, they need to keep telling the world why they left. Unlike anything seen before from the royal family, perhaps the only close in comparison to the intimate details shared by the couple is the panorama interview that Princess Diana gave in 1995. cope with your new status on your own. Do you feel that was your experience? Yes, I do, um, on reflection. But then here was a situation which hadn't ever happened before in history, in the sense that um, the media were everywhere. And here was a fairy story that, that everybody wanted to work. And so it was, uh, it was isolating, but it was also um, a situation where you couldn't indulge in feeling sorry for yourself. You had to either sink or swim, and you had to learn that very fast. On the 10th of January, 2023, Prince Harry's autobiography, Spare, was released. This highly anticipated book tells his side of the story from the very beginning and delivers lurid detail about his life. However, only days before its release in the UK, a leaked copy of the book surfaced with copies going on sale early in Spain. There's been parts of it shared that shocked, surprised me, because there's things that he's talked about that royals just don't talk about. I can expect it of a celebrity, I can expect it even maybe from a politician. But when it comes to royals, there's certain 
things and certain parts of bodies and things they don't talk about and, and he's been talking about it. So it's a very, it's a very frank, I suppose, frank and, you know, he, he wants people to get, to understand what makes him tick, I think is the easiest way to explain it. Confidently sold at half price already. I think it's terrible for him uh, to reveal his difficulties and unhappiness in public like this. I mean, maybe he thinks it helps him, but I can't see how. I think if he were truly committed to serving other people, he wouldn't be serving his interests as he is. From the leaked Spanish copy, news outlets in the UK share that in spare, Harry recounts how he was allegedly physically attacked by his older brother, Prince William. Going into never heard before detail, he describes how their relationship fell apart over Harry's relationship with Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex. In a moment of high emotion, Harry states William called Meghan difficult, rude, and abusive. Harry shared how William grabbed me by the collar, ripping my necklace, and knocked me to the floor. This account of the altercation ends with William's suggestion to keep it from Meghan. And although Harry kept it to himself, Meghan noticed the bruises on his back. He recalls she wasn't that surprised and wasn't all that angry. And instead, she was terribly sad. So the thing about the royal family is the biggest thing to them is trust. That's the, that's the be all and end all is trust. And once you've lost that, it's gone. And I think, I think that will have been lost. I think that will have gone. However, Harry is still the king's son. He's only got two boys. I know the king loves and adores both boys equally. I, I witnessed that a lot on many occasions. So I know how much that love is, just that the queen loved him as well. And I don't think anything could change that. I really don't. I really believe that that kind of love cannot be uh, destroyed. But from the public point of view, there is the embarrassment part and the awkwardness of that. And I think that part, he's closed, he will, they will, a door will be closed in that part. But behind the scenes, as far as the, the love between a father and son, I don't know. I, I'd like to think that one day that will be, that that's fixable, one day they can fix that. Even though the relationship and the public might never be the same again, it would be nice to think that one day behind closed doors they can they can heal that part of the relationship, which I think is that is possible, I think. Other revelations of the book reveal that Harry killed 25 people while serving in Afghanistan and admits that he took cocaine age 17. These claims angered the military and posed a potential risk to his US visa. I think Prince Harry's uh, comments about Afghanistan are ill-judged and potentially harmful both to him but also for the to the uh, the British Army as a whole and, and in the first case I think that uh, he's already under security threat but specifying and spelling out so publicly that he's killed 25 Taliban or well, it's nothing to be ashamed of in fact it's something to be proud of um, it won't you know it will refocus and I think probably re-energize those people who had in the past thought of taking revenge against him for doing so. So I think that's a pretty serious uh, implication for his personal security. Harry also recounts fond memories of his time with his mother and his late grandmother, Queen Elizabeth. He describes immensely private conversations and also mentions attending his grandfather's funeral, after which his father, King Charles III, asks William and Harry not to make his life a misery. Well, in Harry's memoir, there's a reported conversation after Prince Philip's funeral where Charles says to his sons, please, boys, don't make my final years miserable. Now, we have no way of knowing that's true or not. Like a lot of the stories in Harry's book, it might be exaggerated, it might be completely false, it might be a verbatim recording of what happened. But I do feel that his referring to his final years is an interesting idea because he has no way of knowing how long he's going to live. I mean, none of us do. But what I think he wants to do during his reign is for it not to be miserable, for it to be an uplifting and cathartic experience. Because I think what he would like is that when he dies, the country to be in a better place than when he became king. I mean, we can only hope that he's proved right, but certainly the spat between his sons is not going to go away anytime soon. 
Harry seems to be doing everything to avoid responsibility as he claims William and Kate laughed at his infamous Nazi costume he wore to a party in 2005, which he described in their Netflix documentary as one of the biggest mistakes in my life. In a sit-down interview released before the book with 60 Minutes, Harry shares his wish to be a part of the family again. As revelations continue to emerge, it remains unknown whether Prince Harry will attend his father's coronation in May and if it will be possible to rectify their relationship. I think that the general public, the public at large, would be amazed if they knew the level of manipulation and negotiation that goes on between the royal households and tabloid editors and newspaper editors. I mean, I've given this so much thought. I would say categorically, no negative story was ever planted with me given to me. And I was the royal editor of the Mail on Sunday and The Sun, two of the biggest tabloids in Britain. As revelations continue to emerge, it remains unknown whether Prince Harry will attend his father's coronation in May and if it will be possible to rectify their relationship. My feeling about the Harry and Meghan situation is that Harry is an attention-seeking imbecile who has created a difficulty for his family that never needed to be created. I feel sorry for him on a human level. I feel sorry for what he's been through. I feel sorry for all of the things he went through as a child. The fact that he has decided to take out his frustrations and vexation, not just on his family, but on it now seems the world at large, means that it's a story that it's never needed to exist and it's just going on and on and on. To be, I suspect, an element of whinging in this book, which I think, you know, we've kind of got the message now and if he was to come out with some deep, dark secrets about the royal family that we don't know, I would think that would reflect very badly on him. Amazing and surprising and fantastic if this book put that all to rest and said from now on we're going to be a family. It's quite okay for Harry and Meghan to live in America, but to come over here and be part of the family in the holidays. Here we see Harry reaching out emotionally, suggesting that he wants his father and his brother back. So on that level, perhaps uh, a scope for reconciliation, but no contrition on his part. And all of this now builds towards, you know, the prospect of the gathering of the family of the firm at the coronation in May. On December the 8th, the All Access documentary series released, titled Harry and Meghan. The Sussex brand, both in the UK and America, uh, is being helped in one way uh, by this Netflix documentary series by bringing uh, the Sussexes back onto our radar screens, if not our TV screens. So uh, there is perhaps a fear that out of sight means out of mind, uh, and by uh, uh, cooperating with Netflix, on a documentary like this, it gets us all talking about them again, uh, and it keeps them uh, in the limelight, and it keeps their, their brand uh, of Harry and Meghan uh, alive. This was the couple's attempt to get across their own side of the story, from their meeting and attempts to integrate into the royal family through to their departure. The series is unlike anything seen before, only close in comparison to the Panorama interview with Princess Diana in 1995. Years of stories half told and whispered through the media were expanded and clarified. The couple's first introduction was via an Instagram post, Harry revealed. Meghan spoke about the whirlwind of pressure meeting Prince William and Princess Kate for the first time. Meghan even demonstrated her curtsy from the first nail-biting visit to the late Queen Elizabeth II. Meghan claims that her wardrobe was strictly controlled during her tenure as a royal. Barred from bright colours to avoid clashing with the Queen, Meghan chose to wear camel and beige in order to blend in and not stand out. Harry, the Duke of Sussex, is seen in the show proclaiming that royals don't marry for love. Instead, they feel incredible pressure to marry someone that fits the mold. The fallout from this series has seemingly caught the entire world in a fierce debate. And it seems everybody has something to say 
about what the couple had to say. If he, he, you know, he wants to get something across, it is important. I, I have no issue with that at all. I think if he wants to get something across, I think we, you know, that's one thing that we always do. We always hide things, and that's why you end up with, sadly, so much mental health. And so I think it's important that you, that that they can. Royals should be able to express themselves to everyone else. But I think the problem is it's the way it's been done. You know, doing it on Netflix, obviously for money. I think if he'd done it differently in other ways, for example, there was money, but it was donated to charities and that kind of thing. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to... It's, it's a difficult one. It's a really difficult one, but I think if it had been done differently, maybe people would have seen it differently. When they were growing up, William and Harry's relationship was incredibly close. The two of them really needed one another. They had, a, a, you know, an unhappy home environment. They were, luckily they did have nannies and they were therefore kept away from quite a lot of the acrimony that was going on between their parents. But nonetheless, you know, children pick up on, on things. They're very sensitive. And it was also fortunate that they went away to boarding school because again, that removed them from most of what, of the nastiness that was going on. But they did rely on one another. They were very, close. The, the two are very different characters, but they, they complement one another very well. And they've always had a great banter. They tease each other mercilessly, or used to. And then when their mother died, I think that brought them even closer together because they couldn't share with anyone else what they had experienced. It, it wasn't, you know, like the death of, a, of any other any normal parent, because in, with the death of a normal parent, you don't have the world grieving as well. It was almost as though their grief was being devalued by the grief of strangers. So I think it was a very difficult time for them. And, and during that, sort of the, the years after Diana's death, there was a bond which was closer, arguably, than, than most siblings. I think the time when that bond started to fracture a bit was when Harry probably came out of the uh, out of the army and started going into royal work and I think there was a little bit of the space was was quite small within their charitable world for the two brothers together and I think Harry slightly railed at the hierarchy here was his brother, you know, his mate, but who was slightly pulling rank at times because where, you know, because he was the senior senior member of the family. So I think there were one or two little niggles going on there. I suspect that when William married Kate, I mean Harry adored Kate and Kate adored Harry, but I suspect that as with every family, when one sibling marries, their focus turns slightly onto their, their new wife or husband um, and then their children. And uh, where previously their full focus had been on the sibling. So I think maybe, you know, there were rumblings, but Harry, you know, got on very well with them right up until I would say the time that he met Meghan. And I keep saying, I wonder what the end game is. And what I mean by that is, what, what, I wonder what he wants to achieve from it. Because, you know, if we're going to be realistic, uh, over the centuries, monarchies have never always been perfect, and there's been there's been issues, and things have gone wrong, or they've done things wrong, or whatever. And, and sometimes you get people try to fight against them, including family, and it never ends well. You know, the, the, because monarchy is not just about. Uh, this is where people get confused. Not it's not a king and queen. It's not. A prince and princess, it's, it's more, it's, it's more than that. It's, it's, when he used the word institution or a firm, that is, or a company, that, that's it. And, and that will do everything to protect itself. I mean, goodness sake, you only have to look at King Edward VIII, who was made to abdicate and for, because he loved the wrong person. And which is, I'm, I'm grateful for because otherwise we wouldn't possibly have had a queen. So, you know, history obviously is important, the way things happen is important, but what I'm trying to say is that 
it, it's not just a person. So I think if that's what he's trying to fight against, I I just don't know how that's going to pan out. I don't know how it's going to work. And that's what I don't get is what they, what he wants to, what will be achieved at the end of it, other than causing so much upset to him and his family and his father, his brother. That's the bit I'm confused at. I just, I would love it if they could all sort it out somehow. On January the 13th, 2020, royal watchers were on the edge of their seats as Harry and Meghan entered what was infamously called a crisis meeting with Her Majesty the Queen, Prince Charles and Prince William. This was the deal or no deal moment. The future of the royal family was hanging on the outcome of this critical talk. After several tense hours, Buckingham Palace announced with a heavy heart that arrangements had been reached for Harry and Meghan to leave royal duties behind and pursue an independent future. And this is the real problem for the Queen and... All the way through this relationship, we've seen examples of Harry trying to protect Meghan from the scrutiny. You have to remember, Meghan comes in the legacy of Princess Diana, and Harry saw the way his mother was treated by the press. And I think he's very keenly aware of how that happened and, and ensuring that that doesn't happen to Meghan. The decision to move away from Central London to go to Frogmore Cottage and move to Windsor is very much about protecting Meghan. You know, they had just redecorated the place in Kensington. They had just done it up the way they wanted to when they announced they were actually decamping and moving to Windsor. By moving to Windsor, Harry and Meghan are hoping to preserve some semblance of normalcy for themselves and for their child. Even if you look at the birth of the new baby, whereas Kate Middleton was trotted out in hosiery and full makeup just hours after delivering her babies, Megan said from the beginning, I won't be doing that. They didn't even announce she was in labor until after the baby was safely born. All the way through the birth, even in the last weeks of her pregnancy, Megan was not seen. And all the way through her birth, Megan has maintained a determination, along with Harry, to keep certain things private, to keep protected their family. And they are not following the royal script. They are consistently deviating from what's been done before. And some people think it's admirable and some people think it's not. But ultimately, Megan and Harry are doing things their own way. Public reaction was divided, to say the least. While some wished the couple nothing but happiness and success, others felt resentment in abandoning crown and country. The media press of it really speaks to the culture war that's happening in this country between older, the older generation is outraged by Harry and Meghan's decision and the younger generation, um, which is mostly supportive. I think the whole plan that Harry and Meghan have is a really problematic one because they're talking about stepping back. They're talking, their critics would argue, about having their cake and eat it. They're talking about one day representing the Queen on a foreign tour to a, a, another country, on another day, say, in North America, earning serious money with some sort of endorsement of some sort of product. The, the risk is that those two things aren't compatible. The risk is that their pursuit of money will uh, tarnish the Windsor brand and tarnish the House of Windsor. There's no doubt that the reaction inside the palace was just as divided. It's definitely sad for the team at Buckingham Palace. They have a superb team there who've been fiercely loyal to them. I think the assumption would have been that there would have been possibly a core um, number of staff who would have been retained to run some kind of operation here for them. They've decided against that. They're severing all ties. It's a really strong signal that they are off on their own now in America and Canada. The now free couple announced a new future of financial independence, stepping back from the royal family, but insisted they would continue to support their causes and, of course, Her Majesty the Queen. 
they shared plans to split their time between North America and the UK. It's felt like their farewell UK tour. Five engagements in five days, covering off the official, the causes that matter to them, and taking time to say thanks to their friends. But it is the event they'll attend here at Westminster Abbey that is the most significant since they've returned from Canada. Because when they arrive at the Commonwealth Day service, it will be the first time that we've seen them alongside other members of the family since they announced they want to step back as senior royals. And everyone will be watching the body language. Every year since they got married, they've been to the service. Reaching out to the Commonwealth has been a big passion for both of them. Their attendance this year will be a reminder that whatever has gone on behind the scenes, they are still family, as this is one event that is hugely important to the Queen. When they got engaged, there was a sense this was a couple excited about what they could achieve together. A few days later, they carried out their first walkabout, but the scrutiny has proved too much and palace life too stifling, leaving the Queen with no option but to agree they can step away at the end of this month. In just over two years, they have fulfilled every aspect of royal life. Today is expected to be the last of those official duties. In the end, their life together had to come first. And just like that, as quickly as the whirlwind romance had started back in July 2016, less than three years on, they were gone. You know, the monarchy finds itself in a moment of, of turmoil, flux and a genuine crisis because, of course, this has opened up a Pandora's box. There are so many wider issues at stake. The future of the monarchy, this streamlined monarchy that you keep hearing people talking about. What does that actually look like if Meghan and Harry do step down? On their new website, the Duke and Duchess published what was effectively a manifesto of how they're going to deal with the media in future. And part of it was an attack on this and specifically British media and royal correspondents for their monopoly on royal coverage and essentially accusing the media of making private profit from their very public lives. They talk specifically about the Royal Rota, where British media cover royal events to be distributed around the world. Obviously claims they feel they've been hounded by the media, etc. But in reality, they've had, there's been nothing like that. Um, Oh, come Royal, on, you would say that. No, the Royal Rotor system works, I think it's given them an awful lot of, works very, it's been going since the 1950s. And one must remember that this is an unelected institution that relies upon media, publicity, the public support for its life's blood. They are in control, they release the images, they choose who comes and talks to them. I mean, that's a relationship that works in Hollywood, that's a relationship that works with celebrities. It's a great open question whether it's a relationship that can work with a senior active member of the British royal family. The couple decided that they wanted to leave royal life behind and make a break for freedom. But the palace were not receptive. Prince Harry and his wife Meghan considered the extreme measure of breaking royal protocol to contact the Queen as tensions grew in the royal family. Meghan fell pregnant very quickly. They hadn't been married that long when she got pregnant. And According to all reports and rumors, they just had just started trying and she got pregnant. Now, Meghan was not uh, extremely young, you know, in, in pregnancy terms, 36 is geriatric. I mean, that's literally the term. So I think they didn't want to wait around. They knew they wanted a family and they didn't know how long it would take, but it happened very quickly. And I think both Meghan and Harry were surprised at how quickly it happened, but it's all the more of a blessing. Meghan is very much a belly cupper. Every single picture we saw when she was pregnant, she was cupping that belly. Sometimes we had a double cup above and underneath the belly. You know, this is something a lot of celebrities do on red carpets. Meghan Markle is a celebrity. She's an actress. She knows about angles. She knows about what makes a good picture. She knows about what's a good story visually. She's smart and she has used some very smart strategy in her role. There's nothing wrong with that, by the way, to, to use the knowledge you gleaned in one field and career in another one. Meghan Markle has been one of the most stylish pregnant women that we've ever seen. She didn't favor maternity clothes. She tended to wear designer clothes which would accommodate her bump. Meghan has a very slim 
long, lean, beautiful figure. And she was able to wear designer clothes all the way through. She looked gorgeous the entire pregnancy. The only visible difference apart from the bump was her face was perhaps a bit fuller and, and actually it just made her look even younger to have the kind of rosy cheeks that she had through the pregnancy. Pregnancy very much suited her and I would be shocked if this is the only baby that these two are going to have. Megan's pregnancy was actually announced during her first royal tour and there was a backlash actually because it was announced so soon after Princess Eugenie's wedding. A lot of people felt that it had stolen the thunder for poor Eugenie who had gotten married literally like the day or two days before. It was ridiculous because Megan has the right, first of all, to announce her pregnancy anytime she wants to. And probably they waited until after Eugenie's wedding to announce because they didn't want to steal her thunder. But Megan was in the middle of a royal tour in which she was probably going to miss engagements due to morning sickness or fears for her getting pushed to jostle too much in the crowd. She had to explain herself and she had the right to stay home if she was tired one morning when she was in the early throes of pregnancy. So I think Meghan and Harry felt they had to announce in a way because she was in the middle of a world tour, she probably was going to get a little more tired and there might be obvious bump pictures which would just set off a fury of speculation. Megan showed very early in her pregnancy. She was only a, a little bit pregnant and she already had a bump. So I think it was a necessity really for Harry and Megan to announce the pregnancy as early as they did. Prince Harry, um, have you got any news you want to share with, with us in the world? Uh, yes, um, I'm very excited to announce that uh, Megan and myself had a baby boy. Um, early this morning, a very healthy boy. Um, mother and baby are doing incredibly well. Um, it's been the most amazing experience <laughs> I can ever um, possibly imagine. Um, how any woman does what they do is beyond comprehension, but we're both absolutely thrilled um, and so grateful to all the love and support for everybody out there, um, from everybody out there. It's been, um, it's been amazing. So we just wanted to share this with everybody. I'm so incredibly proud of my wife um, and as every father and parent would ever say, you know, your, your baby is absolutely amazing, but this little thing is, is, is absolutely to die for, so I'm just over the moon. Megan's baby shower was very much a baby shower for a celebrity, not a baby shower for a royal. I don't even know if Kate Middleton had a baby shower, but if she did, it was probably like in someone's house with a cup of tea and like a few finger sandwiches. This was not gonna be this like amazing, over the top, celebrity fueled, filled event. Megan did her baby shower as a celebrity. It was thrown by a celebrity, Serena Williams, and it was attended by celebrities and it looked like something celebrities would go to. Megan, in unfairly really got a lot of backlash because the truth is how many women are involved in the planning of their own baby shower? The answer is zero. Megan had probably nothing to do with it, had knew nothing about it except that she was supposed to show up in New York on this date. And Amal Clooney said, look, I'll give you a ride in my jet. The over the top extravagance of the shower has more to do with Megan's friends than it does with Megan herself. One thing that was very sweet about the baby shower was Megan actually didn't open any of the presents. She wanted to wait and open them together with Harry. She took them all home with her and they opened them together as a couple. This is really unprecedented. I mean, normally one of the highlights of a baby shower is watching the mother-to-be open everything. So this broke with tradition, but she didn't want Harry to miss out. In the lead up to the birth, uh, Harry and Megan both said they didn't want to know the sex. They wanted it to be a surprise. So they had to obviously then choose girl and boy names. Had it been a girl, Diana was very much a favorite name and I believe it was very likely that Diana would have been the first name or at least in the middle of that um, long name and the reason is you know from the beginning Harry and William both have included their mother whenever possible in their relationship and I think it grieved them both that she wasn't there when they married uh, she wasn't there to see her grandchildren and so I believe with all my heart Diana is probably in future going to be a girl's name for this pair. In terms of boys' names, there were a lot of names initially floated around. They were all connected with royal tradition, but not typically traditional. So for example, Alexander, which is a perfectly acceptable English royal name, but not as commonly used. And, and other sort of middle names that the royals have had, like Arthur, were two of the names that were favored at the beginning. On March the 7th at 8 p.m., CBS aired the landmark interview led by TV legend Oprah Winfrey. 
the two-hour interview has caused an incredible fallout, the magnitude of which still cannot be fully understood. It was the interview that some within Buckingham Palace must have feared, but Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's discussion with Oprah was more revealing, explosive, and potentially damaging to the royal family than many could have imagined. Harry and Meghan left as working members of the family, left the country, went to Canada first, then America, and then gave that devastating interview to Oprah Winfrey, in which Meghan said that Kate had made her cry just before her wedding over a bridesmaid's fitting, where there had been a rumor long before that Meghan had made Kate cry. So in this interview, she wanted to correct that story and make it clear that Kate had made her cry. Allegations of racism within the family itself and Meghan's admission that she felt suicidal during her pregnancy have been splashed across newspapers in the United Kingdom. Throughout their two-hour TV special, both Harry and Meghan spoke with eye-opening candor, delivering accusations and rebukes that outweighed even Princess Diana's landmark interview more than two decades earlier. Prince Harry's relationship with the media went bad and has got progressively worse ever since uh, his mother died. He believes uh, deeply and profoundly that the media contributed to his mother's untimely death. So ever since her death, he has tried to find an accommodation. And that accommodation has been his acceptance that the intense interest in him could be used by him to throw uh, focus on issues that he is passionate about. Megan, can you tell us what it's like becoming a new mum and tell us a little bit about Baby Sussex, as we're calling him. <laughs> um, it's magic. It's pretty amazing. And I mean, I have the two best guys in the world, so I'm really happy. Well, tell us a little bit about um, your son. What's, what's he like? Is he, is he sleeping well, good baby? Yes. He has the sweetest temperament. He's really calm and... Um... Mm, he gets that from <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and he's been, he's just been the dream, so it's been a special couple days. Who does he take after? Does he look like anyone? We're still trying to figure that out. Well, everyone says that babies change so much over two weeks. We're basically sort of monitoring how the, uh, how the changing process happens over this next month, really. <laughs> he's changed, his looks are changing every single day, yeah. so who knows? And how you find parenting generally? What's it? Is it still a special moment? Yeah, it's great. I mean, parenting is amazing. It's, it's only been, what, two and a half days, three days? Yeah. Um, but we're just, we're just so thrilled to have, have our own little bundle of joy, um, to be able to spend some precious times with him as he slowly, slowly starts to grow up. <laughs> and um, I hear you're, going to, you're off to see two special people in the minutes. Yes. Um, the Queen and, and the Duke. Yes, and we just bumped into the Duke as we were walking by, which was mm. so nice. So. Um, it'll be a nice moment to introduce the baby to more family and my mom's with us as well. So it's, uh, it's been a really, here we go. Guys, thank you. Thank very, you all so much. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Excellent. And thank you everybody for all the well wishes and the kindness. Mm. It's, they just means so much. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Thank you. Behind the tall walls of Windsor Castle is where fewer than 25 guests were invited to witness the newest royal baptism. Those invited taken discreetly to the tiny private chapel. Outside, though, the streets were thronging with people. Those hoping to catch a glimpse of the royal christening, though, were left disappointed. We do pay for the royal family, including uh, Meghan and Harry, and I think that they could have given us a little, you know, um, a little something. I think it should be public, you know, it always has been, why, why change it? It's their decision, it's their family, um, it's not as if they're direct uh, in line. And this royal watcher says the public may have to get used to this royal couple's desire for privacy.
Well, it seems to be the case that Harry has decided he wants his little boy to have more of a private life. He feels he's a long way from the throne and wants to enjoy some type of privacy. But it, it could be a problem because no matter what you do, he is growing up in a royal goldfish bowl. He has got two of the most famous parents in the world. Today's christening is a very different royal event, part of the continuing desire by the Duke and Duchess of Sussex to raise their son Archie out of the spotlight. And they're a couple determined to do things their own way. Harry claimed that when they left the UK for Canada, Prince Charles stopped returning his calls, and this left them feeling they were on their own. According to Harry, the royal family completely cut him off financially around the first quarter of 2020, when they decided to become independent from the royal family. This left him concerned for his safety and the safety of his family. He said that he is now living off his inheritance from his mother. It was a terrible interview, which really did huge damage to the monarchy, to Britain, as a whole, because Meghan talked about the country really being racist and did huge damage to Harry's relationship with his father and with, with William. Harry also accused his father of cutting him off financially, which we now know actually wasn't true. We now know several things that were said in that interview were not true. Meghan claimed that she experienced racism from certain undisclosed members of the royal family who questioned her about Archie's skin colour. They both suggested that someone in the family had made a racist remark about the colour of the baby's skin. And Harry talked about William being trapped in a lifestyle and, and from which he had been trapped himself and hadn't realised he was trapped until Meghan had, had made it clear to him. You know, Megan herself has talked about the challenges of being biracial. She has said, you know, I wasn't black enough for the black roles, I wasn't white enough for the white roles, and I was in the middle as a mixed race woman. And her journey has been in part to find the strength and dignity and passion for that role and, and embodying a beautiful, strong, mixed race woman and all of that means. Mm -hmm. You know, Megan is re-educating people. There's never been a mixed race royal baby as we have now. Mm -hmm. And this is an incredible thing. I remember I was at the royal wedding when uh, Megan and Harry got married. I was in Windsor. Mm -hmm. And I remember there were a lot of women there who were black mm -hmm. with little girls, with daughters who were celebrating this special day. And people can't have any idea what a big deal this is for there to be a black princess, for there to be a mixed race princess, because we haven't had that before. And I think that just by virtue of the fact that Megan is who she is, inspires people, inspires young girls, inspires women, and that's a beautiful thing. The royal family cannot survive if it doesn't evolve and it, it, it reflect the world at large. And to be entirely white it certainly does not do that. So Megan is representing, just by virtue of the fact that she's accomplished and beautiful and smart and talented and mixed race. And it's a wonderful thing. It's great for the royal family. It's great for everyone else. Oprah went on to clarify that the couple made clear that it wasn't the Queen or Prince Philip that made these remarks. Either way, the palace released a statement addressing the alleged racism. The palace said, recollections may vary, but the matters would be addressed privately. The big royal wedding that cost 40 million pounds and was watched by the world. Turns out it was all a performance. The couple claimed that they actually tied the knot in a secret ceremony three days before the big event in their backyard. Perhaps most troubling of all were Meghan's claims that she experienced real and frightening suicidal thoughts as a result of such intense tabloid scrutiny and isolation at the palace. Becoming a royal meant giving up a lot of personal luxuries and independence. There were rumours that Meghan was bullying some of the staff. Her method of working was not 
what they had been used to. Whether it was because she was American, whether it was because she was um, a, a movie star who treated people in a different way, it was not what had happened in the past within that royal household. And I think William, when he heard that some members of staff were being reduced to tears or not enjoying their working life, I think he got very angry and he confronted Harry and told him what was going on. And Harry, I think, was protective of Meghan. So that is where I think the seeds of it all, of, of a fracture in, in this bond that had been so close came from. Then, of course, Harry and Meghan left as working members of the family, left the country, went to Canada first, then America, and then gave that devastating interview to Oprah Winfrey, in which Meghan has said that Kate had made her cry just before her wedding over a bridesmaid's fitting, where there had been a rumor long before that Meghan had made Kate cry. So in this interview, she wanted to correct that story and make it clear that Kate had made her cry. They both suggested that someone in the family had made a racist remark about the color of the baby's skin. And Harry talked about William being trapped in a lifestyle and, and from which he had been trapped himself and hadn't realized he was trapped until Meghan had made it clear to him. It was a terrible interview, which really did huge damage to the monarchy, to Britain as a whole, because Meghan talked about the country really being racist and did huge, huge damage to Harry's relationship with, with his father and with William. Two years after Prince Harry and Meghan Markle stepped back as senior members of the royal family, the couple returned to the UK for an exceptional reason. Harry and Meghan saw the Queen on a low-key visit before attending the 2022 Invictus Games in the Netherlands. The secret visit came almost a year after Prince Philip's funeral which had been the last time Prince Harry was believed to have reunited with the Queen and the extended royal family. On September the 8th, 2022, while Meghan and Harry were in London preparing to attend a charity event, Queen Elizabeth II died at Balmoral Castle in Scotland. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in British history. The Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. The couple chose not to attend the charity event that night, with Meghan staying in London and her husband travelling to Balmoral. On September the 10th, 2022, the new Prince and Princess of Wales, William and Catherine, were joined by the Duke and Duchess of Sussex at Windsor to view the tributes to the Queen and spent time talking to the crowds. There were mixed reactions from the people there. This was the first time since March 2020 that the two couples had been seen together. The couple then went on to attend the late Queen's funeral with Harry marching behind the coffin, along with his family. When it was finally announced that the Queen had died, there was an extraordinary outpouring of grief amongst uh, the nation because, you know, the majority of, of the Queen's subjects had never known um, another monarch. And it was kind of the end of an era. It wasn't just her death, it was the end of an era. It was end of the Elizabethan age as we know it. And of course it was all so dramatic and so beautifully staged that that made it even more poignant. The, the you know, the soldiers, the, the wonderful music, the people that used to work for the queen walking behind her coffin was very, very moving. And uh, the crowd, we know, was, was crying. Or, or, or they were crying, or they were cheering, um, or they were just silent, completely silent. You could hear a pin drop. I remember when 
Diana died and the day of her funeral, you, you could you could actually, you could just hear the birds. You couldn't hear anything else. No sound from the crowd. And that is a sort of real high emotion. The private life away from the spotlight seems to be the impossible dream for Prince Harry. Although with a biography, documentary and TV interviews, it seems to be Harry only has himself to blame. It seems that despite Harry and Meghan's attempt to outrun the media and start a new life in Los Angeles, that storm has caught up with them. Once again, they're on every front page and in everyone's mouths. Their attempt at privacy backfired, but their attempt to tell their side of their own story seems to have only emboldened both sides of opinion. Always the joker in the pack, Prince Harry never found it easy to fit in with the strict, tight-lipped ways of the royal family.